mutual funds. A mutual fund, the mutual funds in the United States were created in 1924, and the first one was the Massachusetts Investors Trust. It still exists today. And, and in fact, we'll give you a story about sort of that variance of returns and what it all means. And back in the day, when the first mutual funds were created, it was pretty simple. Nobody had enough money to basically hire a money manager on their own. The big guys, they had plenty of money. They didn't necessarily need someone. They could build a diversified portfolio. And we've been talking about risks. What did we say? To mitigate your risks, you sort of take more on, right? So building a diversified portfolio says, if I've got all of my money in this one stock, I put all my eggs in one basket. So I have that risk that if that stock goes bad, all my eggs get stomped. So if I put two baskets, right, that's the basics of why you build a diversified portfolio. It's at its most simple level, that stuff we were talking about with risk. So what we started with was mutual funds where the idea was very simple. Some guy like me couldn't invest with a big money manager because I didn't have enough money. And I couldn't really build a diversified portfolio on my own because I didn't have enough money. Up until fairly recent times, you had to buy stocks in what was known as a round lot. A round lot is 100 shares. Anything that's not 100 shares is called an odd lot. And you had to pay more. If you're like, oh, I want to go buy one share of this or 10 shares of this, you would actually pay more for it until about 15 years ago, actually. So you needed to be able to get round lots. And if a stock's trading at 10 bucks a share, and that means you've got to buy 100 shares, it means $1,000. So you had all these investors who maybe understood that they needed to be diversified, but they couldn't afford to go off and get diversified. So it's very simple. Mutual funds were created in 1924 to provide a couple of things. Mutual funds, at their heart, provide diversification. So you diversify, you get professional management, you get a professional running the portfolio at a reasonable cost. That's it. It was no more complicated than that. It was, you want to be able to build a portfolio instead of you doing it where you don't have expertise, pay one guy or one firm. They're going to be your expert. They're going to build a portfolio for you, and they're going to do it at a reasonable price. Now, today in the United States, the average mutual fund, the average stock fund, charges about 1.4% on the stock side. The average bond fund is closer to 1.25%. Funny thing's happening with that, which is that if you judge by where the money goes, so you do what's called a dollar-weighted look, the average stock fund, people are actually paying closer to 0.75%. Now, why is the expense important? The reasonable cost is important because that comes off the top. Remember the example we were doing where we talked about short selling? We talked about how I borrow stock from Yvonne. And what, if I made money or lost money, you know who definitely made money? He did, right? Well, that's the same thing in a mutual fund. In a mutual fund, that reasonable cost, that gets paid whether the fund makes money or doesn't make money. So if you say, I'm going to pay 1% of assets under management, if the stock market or the portfolio of the fund makes 10%, shareholders make 9 Got it? 1% off the top. But if it loses 10%, shareholders would lose 11 Because they're paying 1% of assets under management at any time. Win, lose, draw, management gets paid. Now you know why everybody wants to be in the money management business. Because you don't have to be good at managing money, you just have to be good at convincing other people to buy your funds. They buy your funds, you're making money regardless. 
So diversification, professional management, reasonable cost. That's why we set up mutual funds in 1924. Now, in the evolution of mutual funds, a couple of funny things happened. At some point, you got from where this was being sold to people who didn't have a lot of money to financial planners and getting involved and a bunch of other people getting involved and saying, I want to be able to control what a fund does. And you got a firm called Morningstar that came in, started to evaluate, another couple of other firms, Lipper and CDA Wiesenberger that you don't really need to know, came in and started evaluating funds for what they do and are they worth it and what do they return. And then you got people that said, look, in the old days, when they started mutual funds, it was very simple. You gave your money to a manager, and they ran money whatever they thought they should buy. So in other words, one of my favorite interviews ever was with a guy named Phil Carre. If you ever want to read a really interesting book, Phil Carre wrote several of them. He's been dead now for a few years. But he wrote a book called A Money Mind at 90, and then he wrote a book called A Money Mind at 100. Phil Carre founded the Pioneer Fund. It was the third mutual fund ever. And he ran it until damn close to his 90th birthday. And he worked every day in the office till virtually a week before his death, and he was just over 100. And I had the privilege of interviewing Phil at about age 100. And Phil's response was that he didn't work at a time where there was Morningstar and all the things that now evaluate mutual funds. He took money from customers, and he managed it the best way he knew how. And if he thought the fund needed to be more in bonds, then he put it more in bonds. If he thought the fund needed to be more in stocks, he put it more in stocks. If he thought a stock was good, he bought it. If he thought it was bad, he sold it. It wasn't much more complicated than that. Today, well, you've got funds that come out and they say, well, we're only going to buy one thing or another. Now, if you want proof that funds buy only one thing or another, look at that sheet that you were given. That sheet, and hopefully some of you did your assignment in doing the the warm-ups here. That sheet is the 10 largest mutual funds or exchange-traded funds, and I'll get to exchange-traded funds in just a second, in terms of how much they have in holdings in Ukraine. So every one of those funds, there are more, by the way, holds, has some measure of its investment in Ukraine. Those are the 10, 10 biggest. There are more. Now, if you look, you see how it says Morningstar category? It will tell you, actually this isn't the 10, this is the whole list. I'm sorry, this is the whole list. The assignment was the 10. This is everybody. So this is every US fund that has some of its assets designated to Ukraine. This is it. I know you're looking at it going, some of you are looking at it going, that's a big list. By the way, would you, the, the other thing you notice is that it has that portfolio date thing. That portfolio date is the most recent portfolio that was available. So let me take time out to give you something that you can use. Should you ever want to know, how should I put it up here? Should you ever want to know what funds hold Ukraine? You want to update this. And for reasons as a reporter, you would want to update this periodically because portfolio holdings change all the time. My friend Annette Larson at Morningstar has said that all you need to do is send her an email and tell her you want this and she'll send it to you. It'll take her about five minutes. It's worth doing every couple of months. Portfolios, eh, portfolios change. So... Sometime when you're doing a story and you want to find out, is there a U.S. fund manager that I want to talk to or what have you? It is. You're going to send her this person. Running out of space. You're going to send an email to Annette Larson at Morningstar.com. I'll leave that up. You can walk up and get it. You're going to tell her 
You need to drop two important phrases. My name and Ukraine. Just, she does not care who you are from, but if you say, Annette, I'm writing because I saw Chuck Jaffe giving a presentation in Ukraine, I want to know which one's, she'll have, basically she has a file that says Chuck Jaffe Ukraine, XLSS, XLSX. She will sit down, call it up, make it update, and send it to you. Okay? So six months from now, you say, hey, I need to know who is, who is, uh, got holdings. It'll take her about five minutes, then do the time change. It'll be a day. But it won't be much longer than that, okay? So you can have this. So you see Morningstar categories, and what you see is miscellaneous region and natural resources and diversified emerging markets and a variety of other things. And those have become categories that mutual funds specialize in. In fact, these days in the United States, it's hard to get a fund where you say, all I've got is a manager who goes anywhere based on what they think is right. It's kind of sad, actually, because I think the idea is to buy great managers if you're going to buy managers or buy index funds. It's important for you to understand that because as the mutual fund industry evolves here, it will evolve first with people who are great managers who say, you know what, if you give me your money, I will manage it in stocks and bonds. I will take it where it needs to go, and we will all profit together. But as it gets beyond that, it will be, okay, I'll be the Ukraine fund that's investing in Western Europe. I'll be the Ukraine fund that's investing in the developed nations or what have you. That's eventually where it goes. So mutual funds, very simple, straightforward vehicle, pretty much open to anybody although there are exceptions where a fund may close or not take new money or it's gotten too big, it doesn't want to mess up what it's doing. So sometimes, believe it or not, too much money is a bad thing, right? I can only find enough that meets my investment criteria to invest a certain number of millions of dollars, and I don't want more. But funds will have a minimum. They'll say you have to put at least X in. Sometimes it's an institutional fund. They'll say you've got to put in $100,000 or a $1 million. Sometimes it's $1,000. If you came to the United States and you wanted to invest, you can find mutual funds that will take as little as $25 a month and just let you put in your money regularly, and they'll be perfectly happy to have you as a customer at that little basis growing up. So that's where mutual funds started. Now, what you hear about a lot is the hedge fund world. Now, the thing about mutual funds is that mutual funds in structure and what they can do are fairly simple. The vast majority of mutual funds are going to make their money. Remember we talked about being long, buying, expecting things going to go up, and short, expecting things going down. The vast majority of mutual funds can only buy long. There's a lot of reasons for that, some of them regulatory, etc. Only in the last 15 years has it changed and you've got situations where mutual funds available to the average person can do some of the long, short strategies that balance off those things and do what hedge funds do. Okay? But basic, straightforward, what do most Americans have, even if they don't want it? They've got mutual funds. They've got it in their retirement portfolios. It's what's in there. What, what we have is a, called a 401k, which is a retirement plan. That's now the, the sort of defining thing that what happens in America is that if you're working and you're working at a company that gives you benefits, like my employer, my employer automatically takes a percentage of my income and they put it into my 401k plan. I can then decide how to invest it based on the funds that are available in that plan or they will invest it for me. And that's a fairly recent change was that in the past they had to only put it into the safest possible option. But we've all talked about like longevity risk and interest rate risk. They'd put it into something safe. You'd work for 20 years, you'd come out, it hadn't grown any. Because the rule of 72 tells you that if it's only making 3% a year, it's going to take you 27 years of your working career to ever double what you started with. So now they're allowed to put it into things that are age-based and what have you. And we have portfolios of all stretch and size. You can buy something. If you came to the United States and you said, I have no idea what to buy, you can basically say, if you're expected to be there for the rest of your life, what age are you? There will be a portfolio that's basically targeted at an appropriate 
mix of stocks and bonds for somebody of your age. And then as you get older, and you can't take quite as much of the market risk, it gets more conservative. We use those things all the time. So mutual funds, a very good tool. They do shape the market, but they're not doing the things that, you know, okay, when you've got hedge funds or what have you, you're getting into places that are much, much different. For the purposes of your coverage, mutual funds are useful and they're important. And the fact that you've got the companies that are doing the mainstream, you know, mainstream mutual funds that are buying Ukraine stocks, that's important. You'd like to see more of that. But in terms of who's going to be funding some of the market over here, it's much more likely to be things like private equity pools and hedge funds. So a hedge fund. Everybody's heard the term hedge fund? I see a couple of faces that are wondering. Does everybody know what hedging is? I use the term, you know, sort of hedging your bets. Hedging your bets is basically saying, well, I'm kind of betting this way, but I'm hedging my bet with a little something else. I'm not willing to go all the way. Yes? Exactly. Yeah, it can be protection. And there's a lot of different ways that you can protect an investment within a portfolio or try to do it. So you believe it or not, and it sounds kind of goofy, if you think something is going to go up, one of the ways that you hedge your bets is that you sort of say, I'll bet a little bit that it might go down. And that way, no matter which way it goes, while the bet against it isn't going to go well if the bet for it, like if, if the stock then goes up, this bet against it isn't going so well. But you've done it in a way that... If you were wrong, you didn't suffer. Remember, we showed that short bet and how, hey, if the stock went against me, I suddenly lost a lot of money. Well, this is a way that you can sort of do it, usually using some complicated instruments that I don't want to get too much into, but things like puts and call strategies where you basically are saying, hey, I'll, I'll buy the stock here and I'll take an option on the stock here and I'll hedge one against the other. And that way, if I'm wrong, I've used the insurance to help make sure that I've minimized my losses or what have you. I'll take a little bit less profit in exchange for that insurance that I don't get hammered if I'm really wrong. Make some sense? Here's the thing about hedge funds. We talked about reasonable cost. Hedge funds, the standard cost structure is what's known as 2 and 20. You know what 2 and 20 is? You know what 2 and 20 could be? Okay. Well, what I told you is that the average mutual fund is charging about 1.4 for stocks, a little closer to 1, 1 and a quarter for bonds, but the average investor is paying a lot less than that. If I run a hedge fund, I get 2% of assets under management regardless. And I get 20% of the profits. That's to me if I run that fund. So what did we say? We said if the market made 10% on a standard mutual fund, you would make 9 On a hedge fund, if the market were to deliver 10% and the hedge fund were to get just that market return, well, you would get more like, you know, Six. Why? Because 2% to the fund company and 20% of the profits. So if there's a 20 if there's a 10% gain, two percentage points is your cut for performance and 2% more for your management fee. Now that just makes you think, wow, why would I want a hedge fund, right? Because they're pretty expensive. But the point is that hedge funds then, therefore, don't take strategies that are designed to make what everybody else is making. They're taking strategies that are designed to make a lot more or to produce something that can't necessarily be produced elsewhere. What are the things that, are, that you would value the most? Obviously, big profits would be one. But I can cite a case that I know you're familiar of where the selling point wasn't big profits. Bernie Madoff didn't promise anything big, did he? He promised consistency. 
Market goes up, you'll make money. Market goes down, you'll make money. Whatever happens to the market, you'll make money. And it'll be about this much a year. By the way, sounds great, doesn't it? It's only one little problem. You should have known that nobody can do certain things forever. Like, I can't be consistent forever. It doesn't work. That's what should have been the red flag for everybody was, uh, excuse me, you're selling something that doesn't exist. And then you could have gone into all the other things that would have told you. And that's one of the things that you're going to have to think about because as you get investments that are sold here, we said they're going to appeal to fear and greed. Those are the selling points. And you do that by saying, I'll make you safe. Whatever happens, you can count on this kind of return, right? That appeals to that fear, that nervousness, or we're going to go make big money. Those are the things. Well, hedge funds appeal to all those things, right? So you've got hedge funds that come out with strategies that are working that way. Now, and a hedge fund's an interesting vehicle because you hear about all the glorious things about hedge funds. But the truth is hedge funds are unregulated investment pools, Basically, tomorrow, if you move to the States, a couple days after, you could open a hedge fund. A couple of licensing requirements wouldn't be that hard. Getting money would be a lot harder. And then you got to actually deliver. Case in point. When I moved into my neighborhood, the guy behind me was the, the, the family name is Durkin. The parents decided to move out their youngest son, I'm sorry, their middle son moved in, takes the, son, the house with his wife. Now, the middle son was a stockbroker, and he decided, I'm going to open a hedge fund. Now, I only knew him from, like, walking the dog, talking over the fence, whatever it might be, but I didn't necessarily think he was hedge fund material. But he said he had a loyal following of his folks. He was going into the hedge fund business. And the hedge fund business if I'm going to take the risks of 2 and 20, I'm going to demand performance. So you guys all know about, well, hey, I'm going to give the bank my money, and I'm going to sign basically and say, I'll give you my money for a year, and you're expecting a return for that, right? Well, in this case, hedge fund, you are locked in for a year. There's not any, it's not about, oh, there's penalties if you try to get early. You're in. You are absolutely in. And then at the end of a certain period, there's a window. It's usually about 15 days long. And during that window, you say, give me my money or let it ride. Funny thing happens. You could be the best hedge fund manager in the world. And if you don't make a lot of money or what I think you're supposed to make, when the window opens, everybody jumps out. So my neighbor opened his hedge fund, got his investors, didn't make much money, and a year later was out of business. And far more than half of all hedge funds formed wind up with that kind of a fate. You might think, oh, it's great. You're going into the hedge fund business. They all succeed. Nope. The vast majority of hedge funds fail and fail fairly quickly. The ones that make the really big money, those are the ones that you can't get to. And right now, this is very interesting because in the United States, our government, hedge funds have never been allowed to advertise. They've not been allowed to advertise because there are sophisticated invest in, in investment in vehicles that are aimed at accredited investors. An accredited investor is basically someone who is making in excess of a quarter of a million dollars a year, can show tax returns that show that they've done that for the last three years, and or they have an excess of $2 million in assets. So, Joe, the average guy, if you, came, if you came to the United States tomorrow, you could run a hedge fund, but you probably couldn't buy a hedge fund. Got it? That's high-level stuff. Okay. The problem is that, you know, as Bernie Madoff's case proved, that you had some folks who were far from sophisticated and far from wealthy who wound up getting into it. And it's one of the reasons why, in an unregulated investment pool, in our investment climate, advertising is not allowed. It's not, it's strictly forbidden until two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the government 
approved as part of uh, a jobs act, some rules that will allow hedge funds to advertise. And the very first advertisement that I've seen was for a guy named Jonathan Honig who runs a thing called the Capitalist Pig. And that's his fund as well. Now, I have a basic feeling about this that I've said in print, which is that if a hedge fund has to advertise for ordinary folks, then you know it probably isn't a very good hedge fund, which is a pretty safe bet. But it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. So hedge funds. Hedge funds are basically not constrained by strategy. So as I talked about, you've got a mutual fund, and they're pretty much only allowed to buy long, buy a stock, hold it, hope it makes money, sell it if it goes up. Hedge funds can do pretty much anything. So you have things that are called market neutral funds. And a market neutral fund, they'll tell you it doesn't really make a difference what the market conditions are. This is a fund that should make some measure of return. Or you get an absolute return fund. An absolute return fund basically says, oh, it doesn't really make a difference what the market is doing. We'll give you an absolute return of X percent roughly every year. And you can see where all of these sales pitches go. Now, you piece it together and you say, where do hedge funds do well or where do they do badly? Hedge funds do exceptionally well if they come up with strategies that are relatively unique that they can then follow and take to their own levels. That's also where they wind up cratering. How many of you have heard of long-term capital? Long-term capital was a hedge fund that functionally was using the model of a Nobel Prize winning economist that they felt made the system better than everybody else's system. And it worked fabulously until it didn't, at which point it damn near broke our market. One hedge fund. And that's the danger in hedge funds, is that hedge funds can control massive amounts of capital in ways that wind up cratering things and taking them down. Hedge funds are very difficult to cover. As a journalist, because they're unregulated, do you know what they have to tell you? Nothing. Do you know what they have to file that you get to look through? Nothing. Hedge funds as a reporter, hedge funds suck. There's just no nice way to put it. You don't, it's a very unpleasant part of the market to cover because it's very tough for us to tell when we're dealing with the truth and when we're dealing with stuff that's ridiculous. And trust me, you'd love to have places where hedge fund documents become available to you. As a general rule, they never become available to you. Hedge funds are only allowed to accept a limited number of investors. So if you've got a great hedge fund, it becomes a very exclusive private club. And nobody's going to give the documents away to anybody because if it ever got out that they gave the documents away to anybody, you know what happens the next time there's that open window? There's that open window and the hedge fund says, I'm sorry, I know you'd like to stay with us, but you can't. You're out. We're going to replace you with somebody who wants to come in. And that way we don't have to deal with you causing trouble for us. So it's very daunting to cover the hedge fund world because you're never quite sure what you're looking at. And that's from journalists who know typically what we're looking at. We get into strategies. And you know the amazing thing is when you consider that statement, I'm not sure how much you know about Bernie Madoff. If you've never read Diana Enriquez's book, Diana Enriquez, who was here on the last session, wrote the definitive book on the Bernie Madoff case. Um, if I had my Kindle, it's on my Kindle. It's the first book. My kids bought me my Kindle, and they put that's the book they figured I wanted to see, read first. Um, Diana wrote the definitive book on the Bernie Madoff case. But the fascinating thing about it is that the Bernie Madoff case involved a whole bunch of people, in some cases, guys who ran hedge funds, who were giving money to Bernie Madoff. And at their heart, they probably knew that something was wrong, like this isn't necessarily adding up. But they weren't asking questions, because if you asked questions, Bernie said, I don't need you. See you later. And you don't want to be left out of the party. So you could be the smartest people in the room, and you're still fear and greed 
right? Still comes back to fear and greed and am I going to be able to do it? So hedge funds are very, very difficult. At the same time, there are a lot of things that are quasi-hedge funds or other organizations that do some of the things that hedge funds do. And I will tell you that from your standpoint as journalists here, this is perhaps where you want to be looking and talking to. So hedge funds, one version of the beast. Then there are private equity pools. And a private equity pool is basically a hedge fund that only is investing in private stocks. But I think the better side in terms of what you would want to know is you want to be looking at venture capital funds. Now, a venture capital fund, has anybody heard, does anybody know what venture capital is? No? Is this a new term for everybody? Or? Yeah, okay, risky. Well, a venture capital firm, as a general rule, it's not always about risk. What it's really about is you've got a business, you need funding, I see the potential in that business, and for X percentage of the business, I'll give you the money that you need to get your venture up and running. It's not much more complicated than that. Now, whether or not folks want to do this and how they do this and what they get paid, you know, there is huge risk in venture capital because most small businesses and most small ventures fail. So you come up with something, etc. But if you get the right backing for the right thing, you'll find a lot of stuff. And you want to find out, and I, I can tell you, I wish I knew to give you the answers, but I promise you that there are Eastern European venture capital funds. And that's who you've got to figure out. For you, the best sources would be who that is. And I promise you that somewhere there are Eastern European venture capital conferences where folks go to try to get venture capital. When you are doing stories and you are talking to the folks who are your business folks, like I'm just doing a business profile and this guy's got some great idea or whatever and he's hoping, when they tell you they're hoping to get a bigger plan, you always want to know where they're going to. And make sure that you understand, not because it's part of your story, but because it's part of your sourcing, right? If they tell you, oh, I'm going to go present to the XYZ venture capital fund, you want to be thinking, how do I get a chance to chat with the XYZ venture capital fund and find out what they think is happening in my market, right? So we want to be able to look at all of those things and piece it together. Venture capital funds, private investment pools, they don't necessarily tell you a lot. However, the interesting thing that will happen if the Ukraine market is like most of the developing markets, like India and the BRICS and the countries that are considered part of the emerging markets, is that you will have venture capital groups and there will be more of it and the state may also be involved a little bit in helping to fund and come up with folks that can evaluate and determine. And if there's any of that here, you want to be covering that side of the business extremely hard because that's very cool stuff. And I point out, back in the United States, while we have big levels and little levels, if you believe you have the next Google, it's not that hard to get venture funding. But if you believe that you have some sort of development that could be a successful business, but it's not on that grand scale, you may have trouble. So in Pennsylvania, where I lived for a while, there was an initiative that was basically designed to help start up businesses, and it was called the Northeast, basically it was the Northeast Pennsylvania Venture Capital Group. And they were part of a project that was based at Lehigh University. And they went out and found little businesses where somebody had some great idea, and they took tremendous risk, and basically expected that the vast majority of the companies that they worked on would never make any money. But they had some others. For example, there was a company with what I consider sort of the worst name ever. It's a company called Quantum Epitaxial Designs. Okay, it's English, I know. And I know it's your second language. It's, it might as well be Ukrainian. Quantum Epitaxial Designs. But you know what? 
it's a pretty good chance you have something that has quantum epitaxial design in it. They were making a process that speeded up through the use of quantum epitaxy, and I don't know what that actually is, I just know that it exists. Through the use of quantum epitaxy, they coated wafers that made silicon wafers faster and capable of holding more. I wish I could explain it to you, I don't know. All I knew at the time was, wow, that's pretty cool. And the three guys that are in this company doing this stuff, and literally it was three guys, are either about to spend the next X number of their years like doing something goofy and technology will pass them by or they're doing something that's going to change and revolutionize everything and they sold for, I don't know, 40 million each or something by the time they were done and it became a process that just got put into everything else. So you want to be able to find out are there any of those things? Are there those sort of incubator programs is what they're called in the United States where and some way of incubating business. And truthfully, from a standpoint of, of you guys for stories, if there are any, as much as I love covering the fund business, as a former business editor, find the incubator programs. Find who's trying to do this stuff. If the country considers it important, which all of you have said, there is somebody somewhere trying to start up, fund, do whatever, and if you find out who's incubating a business, there is not a business in an incubator that's not a good story. It's, just, it's almost impossible to have. It's, good stories are abundant. We came up with the technology, we came up with the idea, we came up with whatever, and then we had to see could we ever get it to market. And was it available anyplace else? And does it make sense? And is it of scale? And can it be monetized? Because you can have the best business in the world, but if I can't monetize it, then I can't turn it into something that somebody else is going to want to fund. Right? And what did we say? We say you follow the money. Always want to follow the money. Okay. So, you've got all these things and they're out there. But now we're going to take a couple of minutes and we're going to try to size it up. Now, I don't know how many of you actually went and looked at the pages that I gave you that showed the top ten mutual funds. So since I'm going to have to assume that you didn't and we don't have internet access here, right? We don't have any way to be able to say, hey, let's go look at them now in a group. Do we? No, I don't think so. Okay. So let's go to our list here. And what we really, oh, I'm sorry. And there's one other thing I, I didn't mention. Increasingly popular, and actually I think this will be what you guys wind up with first, is a thing called an exchange traded fund. Now, in the United States, exchange-traded funds are, as a general rule, horribly misunderstood because they're called ETFs, right? An ETF, exchange-traded fund. Because I can show you people in 2013 when I write a column about exchange-traded funds or I write a column about mutual funds who will say, well, I never buy mutual funds. I only buy ETFs. An exchange-traded fund is a mutual fund. It's just known as an exchange-traded mutual fund. There's an important distinction in this. The standard mutual fund trades at one time every day. It trades its portfolio all day long, but when you want to do a transaction, it trades once. When do you think that would be? The end of the day. So here's what that means. You've decided that for whatever reason, you need to take some money out of your mutual fund tomorrow. So you go tomorrow morning and you sell. Now maybe you're moving the money because you're scared to death that the market's going down. Or maybe you're moving the money because you need to take it out to buy something or whatever, but it doesn't make a difference. When you process that trade, whenever you call tomorrow, if you call at 9 a.m., then you call at the end of the day today. I called home now and it's not market time. It would, I would get the next closing price. 
Now think about that. We talked about Black Monday, 1987. If you knew that the market was going to hell in a handbasket on that day, everything was going down, and you said, oh my goodness, I need to get out. If you called your mutual fund company to say at 9 o'clock in the morning, right as things were opening, and you said, sell my funds, they'd say, that's fine, and at 4 o'clock today, we will. You are strapped in for that ride for the rest of the day. Have a nice time. The market today is going down about 10, 12%. <laughs> right? Not a good idea. Not a lot of control. So what happens, let's go back and put this into the context that you had yesterday. At the end of the day, a mutual fund marks to market. What did we talk about yesterday? That is, how much am I worth right now? Right? So we add up the mutual fund owns. If a mutual fund puts $10 million to work and today most of its stocks went up and it gained 2% on $10 million, that means at the end of the day it's worth $10 million and 20000 right? Then we divide that by the number of shares and then we can see how much your price went up. So if your price started at $10 on the beginning of the day, at the end of the day it's worth $10.02. It's the net asset value. Mutual funds, there's no sentiment involved. It's not, ooh, I really like it, so I'll bid it up. It's what everything that's in the portfolio is worth at the end of the day. And the only time that gets priced is the end of the day. So Americans really hate that. <laughs> they hate the idea that I've got to wait till the end of the day, and I don't have flexibility, and I can't do whatever. So they created this thing called an exchange-traded fund. And the vast majority of people don't understand them, and they think they're somehow different from mutual funds. They are not. For example, you guys have Volkswagens and Audis I've seen being driven in this country. They are both cars, correct? Are they the same car? Is a Volkswagen the same as an Audi? They are the same chassis. You may not know that, but an Audi chassis and a Volkswagen chassis, they come out of the exact same factory. They're the exact same base. What? underlines that, that car. And then what they build on top of it is different. But they're both cars, same chassis, same you know four wheels, and here's the basic frame. And then what we put on top of it is different. Mutual fund, exchange traded fund, both the same chassis, the same diversification, professional management, reasonable price. But then the execution, like a Volvo versus an Audi. Make sense? So that what you're talking about is that the, the exchange traded fund, it trades minute by minute. It's traded on the exchange. You want to sell it now? You can get out right now. You want to sell it in 10 minutes from now? You get out from 10 minutes from now. You don't have to wait till the end of the day. That has allowed for tremendous liquidity and tremendous trading potential. But when you talk to somebody like John Bogle, who's the founder of the Vanguard Group, the world's largest mutual fund company, he'll tell you that allows people to trade a lot more easily. And the more people trade, the more they usually blow themselves up, as opposed to investing for the long term and doing the things that they usually want mutual funds to do. So you have both sides of this. And the other thing that happens is that exchange-traded funds can be extremely, the word that they like to use in the fund industry is granular. Granular down to the grain, right? So the smallest possible unit. So in a mutual fund, I am not likely to say, oh, I want to have a single country fund. In fact, for the longest time, single country funds kept basically having a horrible reputation. You could go on Morningstar and they'd say five kind of funds not to buy right now. And a single country fund would be basically, oh, you could go buy India or what have you. Today, the exchange traded fund world, I'm waiting, but the first Ukraine fund can't be far off, can it? Because there's two Bulgaria funds. And I don't know that many folks who are thinking, I got to go do Bulgaria. I mean, as a domestic market, I'm still waiting for somebody to give me a reason why I would want to go, yeah, I, I can't get enough Bulgaria exposure in my European fund, so I've got to go buy. So if you looked at this list, you don't have to look too far down. 
to see J.P. Morgan Russia, right? Uh, to see ING Russia. But if you looked at the list that you were supposed to look here, now there's one difference. These are equity mutual funds. And the list that you have here that you were supposed to look at, that includes exchange traded funds. And when you look at exchange traded funds, you'll notice a couple of things. There are two exchange traded funds in here. There are number three, which is the Global X Junior Miners ETF. That's if you're looking at what amounted to your homework assignment. The Global X Junior Miners ETF. A Junior Miners ETF is all tiny gold mining stocks, or tiny mining stocks. It doesn't have to be gold. Um, so think about the Ukraine market that way. And then you go a little further down, you get to number seven, and it's the iShares MSCI Poland fund. Right? So you're looking at an ETF that only does Poland. If you develop the market enough here, I guarantee you there will come a point where somebody is offering a Ukraine fund. It's just a matter of time. Because Ukraine's not going to be different than any other market. But you might take a look and go, okay, wait, wait, wait. It's a Poland fund. Why does it have Ukraine in the portfolio? It's a good question. Why do you think it has Ukraine in the portfolio? And, and Tanya, you're not allowed to answer because I know you know the answer to this question. Because we talked about it. Why would a Poland fund have Ukraine in the portfolio? There you go. Right? So wherever you've got it, trading, that's where you'll find it. And so when we look at the number of Ukraine holdings, for example, T. Rowe Price Emerging Europe, that fund has one holding from the Ukraine. It's a fairly large holding considering that it's 4%. I do not know the name of the company, but I do know that it trades actually on the, in the UK. That it's not a Ukraine stock trading on the Ukraine stock exchange. Unfortunately, the manager of that fund was on vacation last week, and the portfolio analyst who covers Ukraine for her uh, was unavailable because I really wanted to know. <laughs> but um, so as you're going through, you'll see that you have to go about 25 funds deep until you find somebody that's got three Ukraine holdings. And even then, you're talking about a tiny, tiny weight of the portfolio. Okay, did anybody do the homework on this one? It's okay if you didn't, but it's kind of sad. Because the homework on this one was to basically try to look and see if you could size up a fund using two different sheets. One is the sheet that the fund gives you, and one is the sheet that Morningstar has on that fund. Now, when we look at mutual funds and we want to size them up for whether or not they're good investments, we look at a number of different factors. What's, the, what's one factor that you know you would be looking at? Cost. Know why cost? Because returns are not guaranteed, but cost is, right? Ivan always, always makes his money. <laughs> we know that. So if that's how it works, then we know we need to take a look at cost. Because you're going to pay the cost whether you make any money or not. The big thing that most people look at is returns. The sad thing is that if you had taken a look at this list of funds, out of the 10 funds, most of them, by most stretches of the imagination, have done horribly. Their returns over the last couple of years have been pretty ugly. Now, you could say, what's going on there? Well, if you look at who the funds are and where they invest, if you're an emerging markets fund investing in Europe, or you are what's called diversified emerging markets or miscellaneous region, over the last couple of years, you have a mandate to hold countries. You know what the BRICs are, right? Everybody know what the BRICs are? The BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, the pigs, now the pigs, yeah, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. Yeah, so you can assume that you're going to own a lot of stock in the BRICS and the pigs, and 
The bricks, eh, okay. The pigs right now are doing great, but they were basically porkers for a long time. They were hurting you. So you've got portfolios that you can't look at them and say, wow, what great performance I've gotten. But most investors look at past performance. And it's funny because any chart of past performance has a little asterisk under it that says past performance is no guarantee of future returns. When you size up investments for anybody here, I promise you what they'll look at is how has it done in the past? And I'll show you the chart of how it's done in the past. And then they'll say, oh, well, so if it just does that, but what did we say? We've drawn that market, that whole thing all the time. Here's my performance. Now it's gotten to here. You're going, oh, past performance. Look how good this was. I can buy in. And now maybe it's going to come this way. That's what happened to everybody in Ukraine back in 2008. Ooh, I'm just getting ready to buy in the stock market. Look how well it's done. Because it's doing well, it should keep doing well. No, not necessarily. Past performance, no guarantee of future returns. So you've got these funds. And you're going to look at a number of different characteristics of what goes into a fund. So past performance is one. Short-term past performance tells you, does the fund have any momentum? Long-term past performance tells you, what does the fund do relative to the market over time? If you want to be a momentum player, like, I don't care what's happening. I just want to go where things are hot, and I'll try to get out before they cool down. Then short-term performance is really right there on you. Okay, And the trick is to try to know that you're buying in early enough. If you want to be a long-term investor, you're basically saying, what do I expect to be able to get from an area or an investment category? And will I be able to get that from this fund? Will this fund do as well or better than the investment category? So here's what you need to know. As a general rule, you heard Khan say the other day that index funds lose, or index funds beat the act, active managers most of the time, right? You heard him say that? What that really is about is that over time, the more people trade, the worse it gets because you can't make, I mean, I'm sorry, but when we were doing our coin flip, we just couldn't get consistency, could we? We couldn't get you that you were winning all the time. By the way, there's a way I'll show you later. We're going to use the coin flip example again in another way, and you'll be surprised at how I can use it to market and make it my advantage. But if you can't get consistency or you can't consistently beat the market, and the market gets tougher and tougher to beat every day. The easiest way to beat the market is to do it for a very short stretch of time. The longer you have to beat the market, the more by percentage it's difficult. So the more you would say, oh, so the easiest thing to do, just get the market. But somebody who's making an investment decision is going to look and say, do I believe in this area? And is this fund giving me the kind of performance I might expect from the area? And that's an important thing to know as well when you're looking at funds that cover your region of the world. Okay? Let's say for the sake of argument, and I think it's a good sake of argument, and I hope you will follow up on this. If, you were, if I were in your shoes and I were your editor, and you're covering this market from a business perspective, I'm taking a look at every one of these companies, and I'm finding out who does public relations for them. And then I'm contacting those people, and I'm saying, oh, by the way, when your analyst for T. Rowe Price Emerging Europe comes to Ukraine, I'm buying him coffee. Come on. Why not? Is there a reason? You want to develop sources? Trust me. Fund managers come to Boston. I take fund managers to lunch. I do. It's the best way to get to know a fund manager. You need to understand that as you're trying to develop yourself as sources, that I'm going to take this away from mutual funds and I'm going to bring this down to journalism at a basic, basic level. You have information, they have information, and there is a trade-off that comes as a journalist. Okay, There is nothing better for them than to be able to say, I've got somebody on the ground that I could say, hey, I heard about this company. What have you ever heard about it? Maybe you know nothing. Maybe you know a lot. Maybe it's a business that has potential. Maybe it isn't. But you are valuable to them. 
in that you can answer that question and you're one more person and you might think, I'm not valuable, I'm just a reporter, I'm X years old, I don't do anything special, I'm not invested in the Ukraine market, but that's not it. The same way that I'm here trying to gauge sort of your perceptions of the Ukraine market, they want to gauge your perceptions of the Ukraine market. They want to gauge your ability to say, wait, 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 you know, this company here that's making this product, everybody's talking about it, or no, nobody's talking about it, I just bumped into the one guy that cares, right? What you know is that if they're investing in Ukraine, at some point they're coming to visit Ukraine. And if they haven't been here a lot, they'll have time. You should be on the phone, or sending emails, going, I work for this organization. If your analyst is coming here, I'd be very interested in the chance to meet them and get their opinion on the Ukraine market. And they will happily take you up on that if they have time. And I know you don't think you're important enough or your publication is important enough or whatever. You are, and you should do it. Okay? There is nothing any good stock analyst will tell you. Nothing ever beats having somebody who's there, whose brain you can pick to talk about that stuff. So just as you want to get their big picture, they want to find out what you know about the economy, what you think about the economy, what you think about imports and exports and government and what have you, and who you can put them in touch with and how it works. And ethically speaking, you need to make sure that you're doing all the right things, which is you're not selling your soul to somebody because they have lunch with you. But journalistically speaking, think about the value in being able to talk to these folks, whether it's on background or for an interview. And for most of you, it's probably if they're willing to talk for the record, which many of them won't be, but if they were willing to talk for the record, the idea that you are talking to an analyst from T. Rowe Price Emerging Europe, the fund, with the American fund with the most percentage of its assets in Ukraine stocks, but oh, by the way, they only own one. What do you think of the market? How many of you think that would be a story that you could run? Wouldn't that be a story for you? What the guy thinks? No? Yes? I mean, you know, if you're worried about the perception and what you think. So I would say that you want to go after this. Now, if you had done the drill, if you had looked at the funds, one of these funds clearly was going to come up as better than all the others. Now, we talk about how you evaluate them, and you're looking at all these things. You're not just looking at performance, but you're also looking at how does the fund compared to everybody else in the category. So on an absolute basis, well, if you've been investing in bricks and pigs for the last couple of years, you haven't been doing as well as you would have been in, say, investing in the USA over the last couple of years. But if I'm comparing you to everybody else who invest, like, you could be, you know, the, the best fund in a bad category or what have you, right? So if every emerging markets fund is suffering when emerging markets are in trouble, there's still somebody who's the best of that breed and somebody who's the worst of that breed, right? So you look not only at performance, but then you look at relative performance. During the bull market of the 1990s in America, the, what we now refer to as the internet bubble, there was a period in about 1999 where you could be making 20% a year in a growth and income fund. And 20% a year sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Because it felt great. The problem was that you were, if you were a growth and income fund, so sort of straight, big, brand name companies, you could have been, the average growth and income fund was making about 26%. So you could be going, hey, look, we're making 20%. Sounds awesome. Not so good. You're about... 10, 12, 15% below average, right? And we wanted to get whatever, at least the middle of the group. So you want to be able to look at relative performance. And then when you take a look, if you go to the Morningstar pages on each of these things, and I gave you the Morningstar links, if you go to the Morningstar pages, it puts you out with relative risk. So risk versus reward. And that's that factor that we talked about earlier where we're talking about risk, and it's how much risk am I taking for the reward I'm getting. 
and generally most emerging markets and frontier markets funds are going to be considered relatively high risk. Then you're looking at other things like what would you look on the strategy? Now you might say, how do I find out about strategy? And it's tough. You can look at the documents because fund companies have to file documents and say this is what I do and managers are writing reports. Or you can look at another number and the number is turnover. Now portfolio turnover is a measure of how often the manager's trading. But it's not quite what you think it would be. Because if I told you that a fund had 100% turnover, you would think over the course of a year it bought and sold everything, right? 100% turnover in a year would mean every stock that was in on January 1st was gone basically by December the 31st and we turned over the portfolio 100%. That's not really how portfolio turnover works because you might have stocks that you held the whole year, then you have other stocks that you sold, bought one in, in January 1st and you sold it at the end of the month, you know, and then you bought something else on February 1st and you sold that in May 1st and sold the next one on July the 1st and you sold another one. So you turned over the portfolio, even though you held the one the whole time, the other one you turned a bunch of times. So if you're looking at these funds, for example, the Templeton Foreign Markets Fund has 11% turnover, which means that Mark Mobius, who is the manager of that fund, one of the best fund managers of all time, buys, fund, buys stocks and holds them. Then you get the... I want to say it's the J.P. Morgan Russia Fund, but I could be wrong. It has 394% turnover, which means it's not holding on to anything more than a couple of weeks, right? If you have about 400% turnover, it means you're turning over whatever you've got, you're going to turn over four times in a year. So whatever you hold right now is probably going to be gone three months. That, by the way, is why you want to be able to update the portfolios, right? The reason you're going to write my friend Annette at Morningstar and say, Chuck Jaff, the Ukraine portfolio, send me the latest, is that you're looking at portfolios that change because of the turnover numbers. Now, had you looked at everything, you would have wound up coming to the conclusion that there was only one fund that was logical for you to buy that had the best risk in terms of, do I want to take the chances? It had low portfolio turnover, it had reasonable costs, and it had above average performance. And that would have been the Templeton uh, Frontier Markets Fund. And there's only one problem. That fund is close to new investors and you wouldn't be able to buy it. So now if you were looking at funds and you said, oh, I really want to have a fund that has some Ukraine presence, you'd have to be looking for something else and deciding, do I want to go up the risk scale? Because just because you want it doesn't mean it's available for you. And if you were to size things up under that basis, well, you would be looking at a lot of different things. And functionally, you would be looking to see which fund maybe gives me the exposure that I want, et cetera. And ultimately, as you piece it together, that fund is going to wind up being the T. Rowe Price Emerging Europe Fund for a few reasons. One, if your interest is Ukraine, well, it does have the largest exposure to Ukraine, although it does have it through a stock that is held in Great Britain. So it's not a straight Ukraine play, but again, the vast majority of them aren't. It's just where the market is at this point. If you then take a look at the portfolio weighting, it is the heaviest portfolio weighting, and that's actually saying something when you're talking about one stock because what that tells you is that you've got a manager who's willing to take big bets. Compare that at the top of the first page you've got T. Rowe Price Emerging Europe. Compare that to the bottom fund, the Parametric Emerging Markets Investor Fund. It has three Ukraine holdings but their market weight is 0.15 percent of the portfolio and that's on a four billion dollar portfolio they barely know that they've got Ukraine exposure. I mean, they've got three stocks, but it's a de minimis amount to them. It's five million out of three, out of four billion. That's nothing. That's a, a very, very tiny amount. So if you're looking for Ukraine stock, you'd say, 
uh, at least they're committed and willing to take chance. Then you would take a look at things like the expense ratio, and they're not all here. That's why we wanted you to look at the other pages. But the T. Rowe Price Emerging Europe Fund has a better expense ratio than the vast majority of its competition. Then you look at performance, and the, as I said, the performance for all of these funds, not very good. But the best of a bad lot would again be that T. Rowe Price Fund. Now, whether or not that's what you would make the decision about, well, for you, Again, if you wanted to go through this exercise, part of it is deciding who's going to have the things that you want to buy and who doesn't. And that's where you get back to that, is an emerging markets fund, is a gold miners fund, what have you going to wind up fitting the bill. For you, as you follow the companies here, what you sort of want to know is where they fit into that discussion. Because you think of them as companies but the fund managers think of them as commodities, as does this work for me? So they're looking at it in terms of I invest in banking stocks. Is this banking stock sufficient for me? How does it compare to other banking stocks? Do I want to be in this market, et cetera? I invest in gold mining stocks. Do I want to invest in this gold mining stock? How does it compare to me, et cetera? So as you're looking, you want to be thinking, you think of them as stocks to one extent or another, but your banks and your gold miners are not the same, and they're not sized up the same, and their values are not the same, and what makes them valuable or impressive to an outside investor, not the same. All right, what kinds of questions can I answer for you here about mutual funds and how they work? Because I know that there's a lot here. But if you were to take a look at it, you know, when we talked about types of risk, understand that what you've got for most Americans would be how do I build a portfolio when we talked all about the risks I want to take. And we would say, okay, I want to hire a manager for all these reasons. And then I want to hire a bunch of managers because if I buy like my main domestic fund, it gives me no exposure to the rest of the world. Now, right about now, that seems really smart because for the last year or so, I can't do better than the S&P 500. It's the number one performing index. But again, I want diversification. So I have an international fund as well. And then the question is, do I want to get more granular? Do I want to go off and invest in the next fund, et cetera? Let me ask a question. How many stocks on the Ukraine Stock Exchange? How many stocks? Two? Yeah, but the total number, small or large, what's the total number of stocks of publicly traded companies in Ukraine? Is it 10? I thought it was closer to 10. But several hundred? Okay. So if you've got several hundred, now you may have two that are worth investing in, but several hundred, and trust me, in the United States, we have that as well. We have an entire, we will be discussing this afternoon, penny stocks, and uh, there's an entire collection of those. Okay. So, if you believe, so here's, here's what you need to know, and we'll put mutual funds in context of the Ukraine market. You got a Ukraine market with several hundred stocks. A few that you apparently think are good. The vast majority that nobody here wants to own under any circumstances. But, let's say that you have a fundamental belief in your country, and your economy, and your stock market, okay? If you have that belief, and you could create an index fund that basically goes out and buys all of the Ukraine stocks in a small amount, so that basically one share of the Ukraine index fund will, will, will make it the FEG, Ukraine index fund, that we're starting new business for you to talk, right? The FEG Ukraine index fund 
buys one share of everything, right? So when you're buying a share, you're getting a little bit of every stock in the Ukraine. What have we just done? Let's link this back to the last one. What have we just done to the la to to would that make it more attractive for you to buy? And you might say no, because we know you're not particularly trusting in this room of the Ukraine market. Or you might say, yeah, because my risk is now spread. Instead of saying there's two names worth buying, let me put my money into those two. You're saying there's 700 names or several hundred names. I'll own a little bit of each of them. Now, they're not all going to succeed. They're also not all going out of business. So if the Ukraine market picks up and the economy picks up and the stocks in this market do better over time, now let's go back and we say, okay, you had 2008, 2009, and the run up to 2008 here was pretty strong, right? So we had one of these that came up, right? And then we had 2009 like that. Is there anybody here who believes that the Ukraine market 10 years from now will be worse than it is now? That you believe the economy is in such terrible shape that you'll truly be worse off, you'll be less developed, you'll be more isolated, you'll have other problems, that you'll be worse in a decade than you are today? Not, no, I mean, you're shaking your head. You, you think, I mean, you, you may not be thinking, hey, we'll be great, but you're not thinking like we're falling off the grid here, are you? No. Okay. So let's just make an assumption that we go from this and we somewhere over here take a left turn and we just kind of do this. Right? If I buy here, and I wind up here, I went up, right? 